you just a little bit about our speaker today. He is a chartered financial analysis and consultant, a DBA Spartan Research and Consulting specializing in uh, finance, strategy, and new business ventures. He is the author of Dollars and Cents, a workbook on ABCs of investment. Uh, directed the studies in, in, in he directed studies in advanced financial analysis. And you're saying, okay, where does the aviation link? Stay with me here, folks. High flight aviation as a teaching tool for finance strategy and American exceptionalism. And of course, our topic today, Call of Glory, how the Commodore B-58 Hustler helped win the Cold War. Now you see where it all comes back together here, right? And as and he's explained to me, and we've talked, George has had relationships that he's built, and you're gonna hear more about it, and I'm not gonna steal his thunder. I, I couldn't dream of it because I'm not that smart. But I'm gonna tell you, he's worked his way into this community because of his kind of unique analysis of this topic and his independent look at it. People that have built, people that have flown, people that have had a unique connection with the Hustler have appreciated George's approach because he is approaching it from an independent standpoint, giving it an honest look at what the airplane could do, what the airplane couldn't do, and did the money spent on it really make sense? And now that's what we're going to learn about today. I think it is a, it is a very broad overview. George has published over 300 security analyst reports on diversified companies and industries, various articles on military and commercial aviation, as well as winning first place excellence in journalism in 2014. His numerous articles on aviation have been featured in Airliners.net, the Business Thinker, Experimental Aircraft Association, Spirit of Flight Newsletter, and on and on and on. This gentleman has got a lot of experience, got a lot of information. It's going to be a little bit different in the sense that I think he's going to engage you guys quite a bit today. So this is going to be a college course. I hope you brought your thinking caps, and I hope you brought your patience, because he's going to ask questions. I'm going to run around with the microphone. So wait for me to get to you. I'll be glad to get there. And before we get there, how many of you folks out there, I'm going to say enjoy, but let's just say watch Warbird Wednesday on our YouTube channel. All right, so you're going to get this reference. George is an avid watcher for Warbird Wednesday, so I'm going to give him a root beer today as our special salute. For those of you that don't get that one, Palm Springs Air Museum on the YouTube channel. Come and check us out. We do Warbird Wednesdays, and there is always an unusual drink. I went in the Remember that. I know that. How about a handful of Thank you very much, Greg. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Palm Springs Air Museum. My name is George Kavalakos. I am very honored and pleased to have this opportunity to have this conversation with you about my book called Glory, How the Convair B-58 Hustler Helped Win the Cold War. Uh, contrary to the glowing introduction that uh, Greg was so kind to provide, I don't do lectures, I have uh, conversations, which is probably the reason why I get the top ratings at the University of California in San Diego where I teach finance. But uh, what I would like to do here today is uh, have a few prepared remarks, and then I'd like to open it up to Q&A, because every one of these sessions that I do tends to vary based upon the mix of the audience. Today, we obviously, we have a lot of people who have been in the military. I've met some of you already who actually have a direct connection with the hustler. And with things going on in the world, I'm sure you have some interesting questions that uh, will relate directly to one of the most important aspects of my book is, which is, of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis, this year being the 60th anniversary of that event. I have a lot of insights that I would be happy to share with you on that. But basically what I like to do is I like to talk about the um, reasons, the how and why that the book was written, share with you what I think are some significant conclusions, and then third, what are the specific or special attributes of my book that I think make it worthwhile for you to include it in your collection? Why it should be on your bookshelf? And I'll uh, then open it up for Q&A. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge my thanks to my schoolmate, John Deegan, who is a longtime member of the museum. He's the one that helped set this up and connected me with Greg and everyone else associated with that. 
Uh, my wife Sharon is with me here. She's also my editor, so I'm glad to have her here to provide ongoing critique. Um, we had another special guest that was going to be part of this, but uh, I'm, I'm regrettably is not here. This is this is Maggie. She is a, was a registered service dog. She was our precious one for 11 and a half years. Three and a half weeks ago, we had to, shall we say, place her on her final flight uh, because she suffered from degenerative myelopathy, which is like ALS for pets. Anyway, she was going to be part of this presentation and she was going to do paw prints on the books uh, or your programs. But if you'd like, I can draw one instead for you. But as you can see, she has her goggles and she has her stargazer band here. We live right near MCAS Miramar. One of her favorite pastimes was to always chase the F-18s, and she especially loved it when the Blue Angels were in town, because they would fly right over our house, and she would be out there chasing them. Kind of an unusual dog. But anyway, I wanted to dedicate this presentation to Maggie, because she was our precious one, and I know that a lot of you here in Southern California are uh, dog lovers, so you'll appreciate that. In any case, um, the rest of my presentation, there's some slides that uh, Greg is going to run through as I'm talking that are uh, just composite uh, aspects of the, of the hustler during its development, its design, and its deployment. It has a direct connection with the various topics that I'm going to uh, cover here, but I won't necessarily be stopping and going along and talking about them unless you want to during uh, Q&A. So I'd like to begin by asking a little question for you to think about. And the question is this. What do the classic Academy Award winning star James Stewart, Grammy Award winning American songwriter and singer John Denver, and the classic TV show Twilight Zone, what do they have in common? You know, that's not it. Oh, that's a good guess. But they all have a direct connection with the B-58 Hustler. But I won't tell you that connection until I finish before we go into the uh, Q&A. But that's just something for you to think about. It's a really unique aircraft with a lot of interesting threads. But how and why the book was written? Uh, as Greg noted, yours truly uh, utilized aviation as a teaching tool for finance, for strategy, for American exceptionalism. And what ended up happening was I was interested in writing on the B-58 Hustler because, quite frankly, there's not a lot of information out there about the B-58. It's somewhat sketchy in comparison to other uh, Cold War aircraft. And what ended up happening was the B-58 Hustler Association uh, became acquainted with the work that I do. They like my approach, which is based on three principles, independence, objectivity, integrity, and they said they wanted someone who was not a pilot, who was not in the military, not connected with them in any way to write their story. There have been obviously books, and they're wonderful books, as I read all of them, by people connected with the program, either directly or indirectly, or they flew uh, for the United States Air Force and for Strategic Air Command, but they felt that that wasn't enough. They wanted an outside appraisal, and they liked the way that I did my work when I was in Wall Street, which was to be able to look at things and provide an appraisal of value. There's a difference between price and value, and that's the hallmark of what my work is, is to be able to translate price into value, tell you what the appropriate return on investment should be when you look at a particular class of asset. So, in any case, uh, we embarked upon this, and it was originally slated to be just an article. But pretty soon, Sharon was fielding dozens of phone calls from all over the country, but most importantly from the great Lone Star State of Texas. Yay, my mom is from there. And got a lot of, of, uh, of interesting information, and Sharon said to me, you know, she goes, I think this is more than an article. There's just too much here, and there's a lot of rich, insightful, personal information so we decided to convert it into an oral history project, condense it down, and uh, we created the book Call to Glory, which is uh, here for you today. Now, the book uh, looks at the hustler from a lot of different perspectives, but most importantly, I look at it from a finance perspective, from a game theory perspective, a strategic 
aspect and try to put it in context in the historic times in which it was deployed. And, the, and the, probably the most significant conclusion, and I'll go into detail during the Q&A, is first and foremost, the B-58 Hustler is a case study that the proper notion of economy and national defense, the proper notion of economy and national defense is to build a weapon system that is so powerful that it never has to be used in anger. And that is one noteworthy characteristic about the B-58. Very powerful, and it never had to be used in anger, although it came close once 60 years ago. Second conclusion is that it was a very high cost aircraft. All of the accounting data supports that. However, when you apply a finance perspective on it, when you add a layer of game theory, this was an asset that was not a high cost, low return project. It actually had immeasurable value that has actually cascaded in the decades since its retirement uh, to the present day by being a technology driver, an economic driver, a driver that created an incredible uh, pool of talented people that went on to fly other great aircraft like the SR-71 or went on to Top Gun and flew the aircraft that came out of there. So it was a very, very powerful uh, uh, technology and economic driver that more than proved its worth. And uh, even though it had a relatively short service life, cut short by 10 to 15 years for reasons that we can discuss again in Q&A, it nevertheless uh, more than justified the cost that was uh, laid out for us. The third point is, and I think why I think you'll find it an interesting one uh, to add to your collection, is that there's a lot of information about the B-58 that again is not found in published sources, and I've included that in my book. So for example, the complement of weapons. It didn't have one nuclear weapon, it had five. And I can explain to you the breakdown of that. It also uh, had other characteristics that make it unique in terms of being able to improve the overall capability of the Strategic Air Command. In point of fact, we use an expression, you've probably have heard of it, the risk-reward ratio. It turns out that if you had a, a fleet of all B-52s or all B-58s or all B-47s from that era, another great aircraft, you would not get the maximum risk-reward ratio until you added the B-58 to the component. So the B-58 had the characteristic, and this is why it was such a difference maker in 1962, of being able to create an optimal risk-reward ratio for the portfolio of aircraft. So there you go, I'm using some finance terms in the context of military. You have a portfolio of aircraft. And the B-58 was the difference maker that optimized its risk and its return relationship. And I think the last thing that makes it uh, special, uh, that is my book, is that the B-58 is a great case study that summarizes the highs and lows of a decade that we now refer to as the Soaring 60s. The Soaring 60s. And the B-58 served, interestingly enough, exactly during the period of, of, of the decade of the 60s, from 1960 until 1970. And it embodies all of the aspects that we associate with that period. That include this, what I call, a drive uh, to explore and uh, establish new frontiers. And then it was brought to a very abrupt halt in the same way that other similar programs. Think of XB-70 Valkyrie, think Skyball, think Apollo Moon program. It just suddenly were brought to a crashing halt. And so the B-58, sort of as a case study as to why these things happened and the how and so forth that goes into it. The last thing I would say is that because it's an oral history project, you have the voice of the pilots themselves. Also, you have the voices of family members. A lot of you are probably like me. You can remember in that era when you did drop drills. I remember when the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred and my parents were putting away canned food in the water well, that's a very unique period, and to hear the voices of people from that era that were actually on ground alert 
that were ready to give their lives to that and their families. You get that perspective from them. It's a very unique group of people associated with the Hustler because unlike the B-52, which has been flying for 60 years, this aircraft flew for 10 years and that group of people associated, a lot of them have now taken their final flight and they've gotten their wings of another sort uh, since the publication of our book. So it's all within uh, uh, the confines of, of, of what we published. So I hope that you'll take a look at that. And uh, before I open it up for questions, back to my original one. What's the connection between actor Jimmy Stewart, songwriter and singer John Denver, and The Twilight Zone? I said it was the B-58. Turns out, Jimmy Stewart, in case you're not aware of this, he was quite an amazing person in addition to his Academy Award winning career. He was a major general in the United States Air Force. He's a decorated combat veteran in World War II. He actually flew the B-58 Hustler and he has been a host and narrator of a special film uh, about uh, the, the Hustler when he was introduced into service. So uh, that's his connection. Songwriter John Denver, well, his father was a pilot with the uh, B-58 Hustler, and in fact, I had the pleasure of interviewing a lot of his uh, fellow pilots and uh, navigators uh, connected with him, so that's, that's the connection there. Twilight Zone, kind of interesting. The B-58 is a mysterious aircraft, right? You don't really see much about it. Well, in Twilight Zone, it's referenced in a very uh, interesting episode with Bob Cummings as a uh, B-25 pilot that suddenly transported back in, in time where he finds his old B-25 and he looks up and he's brought back to the present by seeing some jets flying over and he refers to one of them as the B-58. You don't see it, but it's referred to, so that's the connection. In any case, as you can see from the composite pictures, a fearsome looking aircraft, even by today's standards, that's my favorite because it has the five nuclear weapons uh, strapped on there not the one that was in the published reports that you see. And with that, I would now like to uh, open it up for questions and answers. The question was, I'm gonna repeat that eventually. The question was, why was not the aircraft uh, engines upgraded to extend its life, to maybe improve its, uh, its financial return and capabilities? Is that a fair summary of your question? Well, the answer to that is first and foremost, the B-58 was using the latest engine technology. It's a very popular one. It's called the J-79. So they were a technology driver themselves by using the latest and best uh, engines uh, of that era. And there really wasn't much more in the way of improvement that you could go with that. But there's a, another aspect that I think that you opened up here that's really important. Why didn't you do to the B-58 what you did with the B-52 about re-engineering and so forth? The reason is that the B-58, if you look at its configuration, it's a unibody concept, much like the Delta Wing Vulcan bomber in the United Kingdom, which means it has a finite life. You cannot unbolt the wings and the engines like you can with the B-52. So basically, the, 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 the life of the B-58, if you went full out, would be about 20 years. If you did what the, what the British did with the Vulcans, and basically ease back a bit and didn't and minimize your low level flying, except if you're really going into action, you could have extended it to maybe 25 years. But that's the reason why. Was it first and foremost, it was a technology driver with the latest and greatest. So J79s are still a standard. And the other more equally important reason you couldn't do the unbolting of the wings and the and the and the engines. It was a unibody concept. And that was done out of design, you know, to accomplish its uh, uh, technology objectives and performance objectives. Other questions? Was there a reason for the external uh, uh, bombs? Because with the, uh, the increased drag, and if you had them all inside a bomb bay, then you'd uh, improve your, uh, reduce your air resistance and uh, speed. Well, the B-58 was designed um, to be primarily a strike aircraft but with fighter capabilities to have evasiveness. So your point is well taken about, about drag, but even with all of that, it was still a Mach 2 plus aircraft. And, it, it, and because of that, it was able to be on ground alert. So it was stationed in basically in the middle of, uh, of the United States. 
stationed in Arkansas and in Indiana. And so it would, could fly so fast, even with fully loaded, that it actually could reach the targets as fast or quicker than the B-52s that were circling on the perimeter at the positive control points. So even with that aspect, but the other aspect too was that um, it was not designed because of its size to be able to have um, internal carrying capability like that you described. But even so, with those powerful J-79 engines, they were able to attain all of those records. Question up here. Two. Um, first one. This is the first time I've ever seen these items discussed in finance terms. Is this something that's unique to you? Or is it just me hearing this for the first time? I would say to you that it's regarded as being unique, because it was my point of differentiation when I was an analyst. And I say that, I try to say it with some humility here, because the investment business is a brutal business. Just when you think you know it, you know, the market will vary. Okay, so I'm always very careful about it, talking about that. But I've always tried to identify value, different, differentiate value from price. Especially you know, when you're looking for stock winners. You try to find stocks that are underfollowed, maybe underappreciated. You say, well, gee, you know, I don't think that's the right way to really look at that. There's sort of like values in the eye of the beholder. So yeah, it is somewhat unique to me. I will tell you that the Hustler Association were the ones that uh, thought that that was a great way to go because no one else had ever done that. And, and, and most of the time uh, when financial terms are used, it's always based on costs or accounting data, which, while accurate to a degree, it lacks context. It lacks context. So that's what I try to do, is to bring that, to provide a, a more deeper understanding as to what the, what, what's involved with that. So given your focus and its uniqueness, is your area of research interesting to our higher level, our highest level of the military where they're making decisions about new weapon systems? Are they consulting with you? Is this something that just I'm fascinated by? Or are there others that are way more important than me? Well, I would say that, that there has been um, a greater level of interest in that that is trying to look at things in broader, more strategic terms, involving you know, utilizing game theory, uh, utilizing finance, but it takes time for that to filter through because you know what I have found is that I've been always able to find certain people or pockets where they, they grab onto it, like you have. It's interesting, it's unique. Uh, it gives you different insights, but not everybody sees it in that way. Most, regrettably, High-level decision makers tend to look at things in linear terms. And we live in a non-linear world, you would think otherwise. But even the, the, what I have found was like, for example, the Rand Corporation, which did a study about the B-58, and I read it. And I know the people at the Rand Corporation. And the information is that they use, which is accounting based, was accurate. There's nothing that is inaccurate about it. But the interpretation and the lack of context is what renders it not a completely useful way of, uh, of assessing the aircraft. I think we're seeing more of that. I have a copy of, a, of the doctoral dissertation that was done by James Orr. Now, for those of you that are aviation aficionados, you might remember that name. He was secretary uh, for the United States Air Force in the 1980s. And he later wrote a doctoral thesis after he finished his, uh, his tenure as uh, with Claremont University about the B-1 bomber. And I have a copy of that thesis, and I read through it, and, and uh, Dr. Orr, I can address him as that now, his assessment utilized some of the things that I talked about. He looked at history, he looked at different types of metrics. So you are starting to see more of that, but it takes time, I think, for that type of, of perspective to, uh, to get it there. I do think you're seeing more game theory, though. Or at least you should. Question is about the was it the Soviet um, capability with uh, surface to air missiles that maybe rendered the B-58's mission obsolete and that contributed to its uh, re uh, early retirement. 
That certainly entered into the reasoning. However, in, 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 again, to provide complete context, the B-58 was designed to basically, and this is in the oral history part of my book, that the B-58 was designed to fly at high altitudes, but when it would then approach the adversary's territory, it would then drop down, and it would be able to fly literally you know, 500 feet off the deck, low level, to evade uh, uh, tracking radar, and then be able to launch their, their, their weapons. So, in point of fact, it did have, it still had that capability. The, the, uh, the idea of, of, uh, of it being, you know, vulnerable to the sands was correct, but here's the other thing that that misses, is that, again, you create the greatest firepower by being able to have a mix of purpose-built aircraft. So the B-52s had one set of capabilities, the B-58 had another, and used in combination, it would have been able to, uh, to fulfill that mission. But that was one of the reasons that was mentioned, which is correct if you take it at, at, at a, you know, literally, but again, that's, that's just one, one dimension. The question was, and I'm going to use this as an opportunity to differentiate about my book, that uh, Robert McNamara, a person's name who is not found in my book, by the way, McNamara's name is not found in my book. By the way, that's one of the trivias about my book. I only have one mention of JFK, one mention of Khrushchev, because of a statement that each one uttered in direct connection with the B-58. Everyone else is taken, because I wanted this to be a story from the Hustler pilots. So, Political figures and so forth are not part of it. But to your question, McNamara ordered that the um, uh, that the B fifty eight be grounded because of sustainment costs. Here's what what happened on that. He had done the same with the XB seventy Valkyrie. That was the uh, the high flying bomber built by North America. Yeah, the, the, and I write about that in Call to Glory that that was uh, canceled. Uh, the question was, was, could they continue to use the technology driver? That was another issue that, that is, you know, that is sort of there's two sides to. Skyfall was canceled, then the B-58 was grounded, ostensibly because of maintenance costs. But one of the things that I point out in my book, with all due respect to the person you mentioned and all of the whiz kids from the era of World War II who made enormous contributions to the arsenal for democracy, You don't analyze a sophisticated capital asset like the P-58 or the Apollo Moon program the way you would analyze doing cost-benefit ratios for consumer products like automobiles. A little inside joke, Mr. McNamara was the president of Ford Motor Company before he became DOD secretary. The point is, and that's not meant to be disrespectful, but what it means is that you have to look at context. Now, the Rand Corporation study that McNamara commissioned said that the cost to maintain the two wings of B-58s was equal to maintaining the cost of six B-52 wings. So you have 80 aircraft versus 270. Here's the problem with that analysis, is that it ignores the fact that if you go to an all B-52 force, suddenly the risk-reward ratio skyrocket, suddenly the, the, the risk goes up. You endanger your pilots, you endanger the success of the mission. Second thing that it ignored was the firepower. You don't measure nuclear capability by stockpiles, you measure it by firepower. The B-52 during that era carried two nuclear strike weapons. The B-58 carried five. So from a mathematical perspective, each B-58 had 120 ordered combinations that could launch their weapons. The B-52 had two. Multiply that by 80, you have 960 combinations. You see the mathematics. Well, even with six wings of B-52, guess what? Your combination is only 540 versus 960. So if we follow Mr. McNamara's analysis following numbers, he's only looking at it from an accounting basis, looking at price, not at value. But the other thing is this, and it's mentioned in my book, and I, and I probably should bring it up here. Uh, there was also a shift in public policy. There was a shift in public policy. When you focus on uh, negotiations, you focus on settlements, you end up making concessions. So what happened was, that, remember at that time, in the late 60s, 
We were involved in something called SALT. No, not the Buckner Dinner Table. Strategic Arm Limitation Talks. And a concession that was made at the very outset was, we're going to ground the B-58s. So they did. B-58 was grounded. But you know what happened about three months after the B-58 was grounded? Soviet Union launched the backfire bomber, a knockdown version of, of our B-58, and not nearly as good. So other things come into play. It's not always about uh, numbers, and it's not always necessarily about even strategic value. This is where game theory comes into play. You make such a decision, you have to also understand the behavior of the adversary. How is he or she going to look at that? You look at that as saying, I'm being nice to play in the sandbox. Not realizing that the adversary says, fine, thank you, what else are you going to give me? This is where game theory comes into play. And this is where my specialty in finance was behavior science. This is how it didn't work in Wall Street. Because it's not just about numbers. If it was about numbers, all you do is follow computer programs. There's the behavioral aspect. And that's why the B-58 is exciting claim to study that. There's so much history on that. There's a missing part of history about the Cold War, and that's why I like looking at that, particularly, like I said, coming up the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Other questions? Yes, sir. You said there were about 80 of the hustlers built. Well, there was 116 built, but there was 80 deployed. There was two wings. Each wing had 40. 40 uh, in Arkansas, 40 in Bunker Hill in Indiana. And how many remain? How many remain? In museums? And Six. Six. Are they the flying condition? No. <laughs> I wish that they were. I wish that they were, yeah, they, you know, uh, uh, regrettably, they, uh, most of them got shredded up. Kind of like the flying wing. I saw that on the wall of honor there, General Cardenas, uh, who flew the flying wing. Yeah, the flying wing, every one of those were shredded also. A question back here. So you mentioned 116 were built? Yes. So what would it cost you in today's dollars per aircraft? Well, um, I actually use 1967 dollars as the cost of aircraft, and to keep it again context in, in that in that time period. So the cost of a B-58 was about 33 million. Cost of a B-52, which is a prior generation aircraft, was about a 10, 11 million dollars, and, and again in 67 dollars, a B-47 was about three and a half, four million dollars. But keep in mind that. For the B-58, all of these new technologies were developed. And this is not to make excuses, but when you're a pioneer in your field, you end up taking the slings and arrows. So all of those costs that were uploaded or front-loaded costs on the B-58 were able to be passed down to all successive aircraft that followed. You know, the first version of the B-1 and the other uh, uh, variants that have followed. So it had to start with, with somewhere. Making an approach to 500 feet and dropping the Gringo weapon much too exciting. What was the uh, launch, actual launch configuration for, um, for launching those uh, weapons? According, according to the uh, 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 oral history that I got from one of the pilots that disclosed that, they used gravity. They used uh, uh, gravity bombs uh, to launch that. So uh, they didn't have drone capabilities like Hound Dog missiles did on the B-52s. But they would use parachutes. So what they would do is they would they would come in at low level, drop, and then do a, a climb out. Now here's the interesting thing. I talked to all of these pilots. This is an extraordinary group of, of people. I mean, like none like I've ever encountered in my interviews. They all knew that this mission might be it. Might be it. One way. Even though, by the way, they had they had a place to go after they made their launch. I mean, there were there were bases. I mean, I have all of that information, and some of it is mentioned in my book. But that's that's how they did it. Yeah, exciting is the right word. But but this is an interesting thing. You you, you raise a very good point. It took a very special type of person to fly a B-58. It was it was not an easy aircraft to handle. And uh, it required a certain mentality, and also because it was an exclusive nuclear strike weapon, 
you also have, have a different mindset. So yeah, you're absolutely right about that. The question is, how many crew on a B-58? Three. So you have, you know, you, you, bet you have the pilot, you have the defense uh, uh, services operator, and you have the navigator. And one of the interesting things about the B-58, and there's a section in there that discusses it and shows that they, have, they, they pioneered the use of the escape pod. Pioneered the use of the escape pod. But yeah, they were all three working in tandem, and there's a whole section talking about how they work together as a, as a team. Very interesting in terms of uh, exercise and teamwork. Yes, sir. Boy, that's a great How question. How did you find them all? How did I find them all? Where did they all hang out? They found me. Uh -huh. <laughs> Actually, well, what happened is I, I don't know the, the specific number as to how many were trained because I know that enough, because it's an exclusive nuclear strike weapon, um, in some cases they drew from existing pools for B-52s and B-47s. Others were trained specifically to fly just the B-58, and some of those that were trained to fly the B-58, some of them ended up flying the F-105, which is right here. Uh, some of them went on to Top Gun. Um, but the number is getting very small. Um, they host their annual reunion, or they did until very recently, because it's getting smaller and smaller, in Fort Worth. And so I contacted the Hustler Association. One of the, one of the people that I did for a previous article gave me some information on how to put a contact. One was a former congressman that helped me. And um, through all that, I was able to, to get them. And then what happened was they let each other know. And they say, hey, there's this guy in San Diego. And then suddenly the phone calls started coming in. And it was, and most of them, I think, uh, as I said, seem to be from the Lone Star State, uh, because that's where the, the aircraft was built. But yeah, regrettably, it's a small group. It's a, it's a very elite group. In fact, um, uh, Vic Mayer, Colonel Vic Mayer, who's one of the contributors, and he writes there, he goes, we were the Black Sheep Squadron of, of SAC. So those of you that are aviation fans know that term, Black Sheep Squadron, that's how they refer to themselves. So small, elite, and um, it's really neat to be able to, uh, to remember them and to pay tribute to them, which was uh, my main motivation, was to make sure that their story uh, does not go unheard. Well, I think the question was, you know, the, the plane, when the Cold War didn't fire a shot, how did it happen? Actually, if you look at the title of the book, I'm not trying to be rude, but it said how it helped win the Cold War, okay? So it wasn't any one aircraft, it's obviously a lot of events, a lot of special people, you know, that come into play. They, what I would point out to be, again, following the lines of independence, objectivity, and integrity, the, the, the Convair B-58 Hustler during its 10-year service life fulfilled its role admirably. It not only met all its objectives, it exceeded them. In the biggest showdown of all in 1962, it was a difference maker because it was the one item that in, in, the, in the arsenal that they could not defend, that they couldn't stop, that it would have been able to accomplish its mission before they even knew what hit them. Uh, basically, the story is this. I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you here. What happened was, as you recall from your history, we lost a U-2 aircraft. Okay. So the question is, what do we do now? What do we do now? How do we know what you know? What? How do we know what the adversary is doing? So what was done? Mentioned it called the quarry. We dispatched a B-58 Hustler. But the B-58 Hustler was not carrying its little five buckets of sunshine. That's a British term, by the way, bucket of sunshine. They weren't carrying the buckets of sunshine. They carried uh, a photo recon pod, quick jet, they called it. And it flew and it did a flyover. And it sent two messages. First and foremost, it said, we're still keeping an eye on you. But the B-15 came so fast, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't even aware until it was like over. So it was sending a second mission. Second message, which was, the next time you see this plane, that's when the sunshine will come. The reason I know that is that one of the I, I interviewed the pilot that that was his mission. His mission was very simply this. He said, son, my mission was to sink Huber into the ocean. 
And with my five minutes, I would have done it. And it's an interesting point because, of course, as more stuff that's been declassified that has come out, it's, they've been saying that, well, the moment, you know, if, if our planes were coming, if our troops were coming to do an invasion strike, that they would have started throwing nukes at us. Well, the idea was with the B-58 Hostler, it's coming in so fast, drop down low, the enemy wasn't going to know what hit them. That, so that was the psychological message that was sent when we sent it after the, uh, the E-2 went down. And a lot of people don't know that. That's kind of one of the things that sort of has flown under the radar, so to speak. So, great question. He asked, was it built exclusively for nukes, or did he have conventional capabilities? It was exclusively built for nukes. It did not have conventional capabilities. And that was, and, and it was that, to be objective about it, because it was not suitable for conventional strikes, that was something that you could not, no matter what you can do with finance, you couldn't find a way to get around that. The question is, is did the cost of maintaining it justify because of its exclusive nuclear strike? Well, I would argue, I wouldn't argue, but I would say yes, it did. But if you were looking at it as strictly conventional, no, it was not. It was not effective at all for that. In fact, that's why it was never used uh, in the Vietnam War. There were questions about, gee, why not use that? But it was not. Didn't have those capabilities. Well, well, the, qu the question was, why did it have to carry five nukes? And I said, why not? Well, do it. History said one, one will do it for a Ah, but that okay, great. Thank you. That's a great. That's a great thing. Here's another little tidbit in my book. Why did it carry five? Because it's a nuke. Well, here's the point. The main, the main uh, nuclear weapon, the big one, and if we use mathematical terms, let's just say 5x, okay, is, 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 the, uh, is the center weapon. The other four would be 1x, okay? So the big one had five times the capability of the other four. Now you might say, well, it's nuclear. There's a reason. Because the big one would be used for a civilian population center, take it out completely. The other four would be used to, to take out uh, um, military targets. So, you know, it could be uh, SAM missile launchers or other uh, military assets. So that's why they did five. So you had five with one big one and then four smaller ones, what, what, what might be called tactical nukes. Still buckets of sunshine, still very powerful. In your conversations with all these different pilots that flew them, how, how frequently did they scramble? I mean, did, were they having to go up quite frequently because the Russians were testing something, or was it a rarity? The B-58 the, uh, Hustler was a ground alert aircraft only. It was a ground alert aircraft only. So during the, the Cold War era, when we always had uh, a certain amount always flying 24-7, it was not the B-58s, it was always the B-52s that were the mainstay of that. The B-58 was a ground alert aircraft, and because it was an uh, exclusively nuclear strike, uh, it would only be doing that on drills, that they would do their flying, uh, their, you know, their, their flying activities. Now, because it was such a high-performance aircraft, it was used uh, to do a lot of, of uh, test projects. So that's why, for example, it won five of, uh, all five of the aviation trophies for that era. Uh, and also, uh, it, it was uh, because of its capability to be able to get to where the B-52s were, you didn't have to have it flying all the time. But the other factor was this. Remember, as I said earlier, it is a unibody aircraft. So there's a finite fatigue life to that. So you don't want to fly it constantly so much and always doing all the takeoffs and landings because you're going to, it's going to create more wear and tear. So that's a, an economic or financial consideration as well. It's kind of like, I guess, with a really nice high-powered sports car. You know, you got to, it's a sort of a kind of a happy medium. And in a way, that's what the B-58 was like. Well, I want to take this opportunity here, since this wonderful bottle of root beer has been planned here, this is, oh, this is perfect. Earp's Original Sarsaparilla. I'm a big fan of the, of the Wild West. I always used to tell my mom that I, I wanted to be a cowboy. So uh, this is great. 
This is great. I love I love the story of wire and so we we'll take this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, drink in honor of the hustlers, the B-58 pilots, all of those that were prepared to give their lives, as I just answered the question a few moments ago. So let's drink in their honor. We're here. We're here.